<laughs> so we'll start with the meditation. Try to find a comfortable seat. Like some place like Nancy said last class where you're not really holding your legs. You're in a certain position, relaxed, grounded. Try to find center in place for your back. Your spine is like really straight. Each vertebrae is stacked one on top of the other like a column. And no tension in your neck. So if you can make some conscious effort just to melt away inch by inch, any tension in your neck on the top the bottom and then your shoulders. So we're really going to see how much we can increase the intensity of our focus in our meditation. So just begin, follow your breath, look for that point at the tip of your nose, where it's coolest on the inhale, warmest on the exhale, just look for any subtle, subtle, subtle degrees of change. Tuning 
we're fine tuning our focus. So start to check when you're too close and your mind bounces off the object and you need to release a little bit. Just pull back. Back off just slightly. And then surrender to it, surrender into it. So this isn't um, one of our meditation assignments. Maybe we can close it. Close the uh, curtain. Sure. Is that okay? Is it okay? Is it bad? No, what air? Is it? Oh, it's okay. Is it cold for you? Okay. Are you cold? Are you cold? I'm happy if everyone else is happy. Are you cold? She's a little cold. Maybe turn it up. Yeah. Maybe turn it up. So this is like the crowd we've assembled today. I, I fair to say that you're all good meditators. You know? So then it'll be it's interesting to talk about you know meditation. So this exercise, you know, it's, I don't know if this is something that you're already doing, but it's something that you should start to put it into your meditation practice somehow, you know, because this is something that will give you more of an idea about um, in meditation intensity. Do you remember uh, NAR? Do you remember that? So this is what this is something that can increase your NAR, which is this crystal clear, laser sharp focus, right, of a concent concentration on a single pointed object. Um, when we got this course, then I think Lama Lizette was saying that in the beginning level, usually there's problems like dullness would be very gross form of dullness where you might be falling asleep, kind of like dozing off. And then agitation, just, you know, you're thinking, you, you might think of something for 10 minutes before you realize you're off the object. But now, uh, maybe those problems are more in the background, they're not so, um, those gross forms of subtle agitation, and subtle dull, uh, gross agitation, gross dullness. Now it's more like, do you have the sharp, laser sharp focus on the object? Like crystal clear, like perfectly bright, you know? And there's all oh, so many reasons why it would be subtle dullness or subtle agitation, you know? We could, a lot of it we can address in the preliminaries, you know? And, um, and then with the types of Anal analysis, right? That an analytical meditation we do is going to determine kind of do we have a fuzzy object or a very in-focus object, you know? 
So even in the very beginning of the preliminaries, to start with this on the breath and zoom all, you know, zoom in. And then see, right, you're zooming in, going closer and closer. And then it's almost like uh, this starts to be like a vibration because it's getting too close. You know, like it's getting more and more intense. And then there will be a point where your mind bounces off the object. Where you just went so close that the intensity is too high and then you bounce off the object. And that's an important thing to do. You need to do that because we have to figure out where it is that we will find balance in meditation. You know? So you want to bring yourself too far. You want to bounce off the object. You, you want to let go a little bit. Now, I don't know if you remember the antidotes, but remember one of them was stop applying antidotes when they're not necessary. So it's kind of like this is, right now we're faced probably amongst us that too much dullness, really. You know, that when you get up to the object, it's too dull. So we're, we, we're applying the antidote of focusing in, right? And we're focusing in more and more intensely and then we have to find the point where it's too far. Because if you just let go a little bit, and then you dive in. You see, like, so you go, you go and then it start like shaking. This is like an analogy, I guess. So you're going, you're going, zooming in, start shaking, it's getting really, really intense. Then you go too close, automatically your mind bounces off. So you just let go a little bit, and then you have the object, and then you just release into the object like you're jumping into a swimming pool. So you become immersed by the experience of the object. So it's neither too intensely focused in, and it's not too withdrawn. It's the perfect balance of meditation, right? And how Geshe is always like, is like driving a car, you know? So that's one, you know, you're going too far. Check, really experiment, see. See how far, can you be can you be all the way, that point is like huge and the wind is like <laughs> it was like blowing your hair back all the way at that point at the tip of your nose, you know? How close in can you get, you know, without getting distracted like that? Mm. Okay. So let's go over, right, in like the traditional Tibetan way, kind of. Let's go over the flow of the classes that we've had so far. So how did this course start? The <laughs> <laughs> question. I Well, no, yeah, right. How do you keep the mic? How about this, this, this specific course three? <laughs> Give it a doubt. <laughs> yeah, so what we went, what we were really addressing in the beginning of the course were the, uh, first of all, the obstacles to achieving nirvana, right? And then all the way up to class three, then we really talked about what is, what was it? What was, what was the thing that was keeping us from achieving nirvana? What was the obstacle to achieving nirvana? Yeah. Right, but what, it's a belief, something. Things are fit. Functioning thing, Funny. right? I believe it. The questions are just Yeah, are they? Okay. <laughs> so the main obstacle to achieving nirvana, which is complete cessation of mental afflictions, is belief in functioning things. Because when we believe that something has fixed characteristics, or that it has qualities, then we can have a mental affliction. Right? So, when we let go of the belief in the fact that things have qualities, then we're free, right? Then the, the mind has the ability to transform into a mind with absolute no mental functions, right? Is this all ringing a bell? Yes. A little bit? A little something? Okay. Then, then we went from that into class four, right? And class four, and we're kind of still talking about the homework from class four in this class, if you know this, if you want to try to do the homework. Um, class four was all about the lot, right? Mm, and 
do it. You know, why would class four be about the Lama right after we talked about eliminating the obstacles to achieving Nirvana? You know, and that's because the Lama is the highest, um, what's the word, manifestation, right? The highest manifestation of Nirvana. And then if you remember, it was like at least it's an idea which represents your highest understanding of wisdom and compassion, right? And at best, it's an enlightened being that's there sharing with you how to eliminate suffering, right? They said, if you see the Lama has no qualities, then you will succeed, right? But if you see that the Lama has qualities, then you're going to suffer, right? Mm. So misunderstanding the true nature of the Lama will keep you from your heart. So do you see the connection? And then class five was all about overcoming the obstacles to omniscience. Is this ringing a bell? This is our last class. <laughs> um, and here we remember the mouse and the leaf. Right? We talked about the mouse and the leaf. We talked about how projections work. We talked about how these were two different moments. These were two different moments in time. And it's not that the mouse, something with the qualities of a mouse, changed into something of the qualities of, with a leaf, of a leaf. Right? They're two discrete moments. Two discrete moments of awareness, right? That never touch. But w were we actually talking about a mouse and a leaf? Or were we talking about something different? So we were talking about the Lama, right? We were talking about the Lama. Two different kinds of mental images, right? One is of an ordinary being. Remember this choice? One was of somebody who heard a story from someone else and read the story in a book and then came to tell you the story. All right, that's one kind of view of the Lama. That's one kind of mental image. And the other mental image was of an enlightened being who's emanating to you as someone who you can relate to in order to share with you how to end suffering for you and all beings, right? So it was about seeing these two different moments of awareness, these two different mental images, discrete moments of awareness, totally equal, right? 100% equal to each other. 100% empty, 100% projections, you know? Um, and deciding that one is going to get me to my ultimate goal in the quickest path and then choosing that one, right? But it wasn't about, it wasn't a matter of pretending. Because if you go into a situation and you start with pretending, you're just going to get your butt kicked, you know, because you can pretend all you want. It doesn't change what you're being forced to see. It doesn't mean you pretend that suffering is pleasure. It doesn't mean you pretend that a jerk is a good guy. Okay? That's not what it means. Because remember the direction of Bhavna Krama. First, you define the thing. First, you define it. And then through, then through logic, you prove that it's empty, right? And then through that doorway, you can transform it. So it's not a form of pretending that comes before the analysis. It's a choice you're making once you've found that the mental images are equal, but they give rise to drastically different results. And then you choose to view it in a certain way to get further on your path. Is this that ringing a bell? It is, right? <laughs> um, and uh, Nancy La said, everything is valid, nothing is correct. You know, they're both totally valid. Both views are valid. You know? 
they're both totally incorrect because the the definition of deceptive reality, right? It's appearing different than how it really is. It's appearing that, and that doesn't mean go and walk in front of a bus. It means recognize what it is, and then go through your analysis to transform it, and then choose the mental image that's going to get you to your goal in the quickest path, and then tsin sam, hold the line, hold the line on that viewpoint. So many, many, many people make a mistake, I think, it seems, to s once they get emptiness teachings and then drop the analysis and just start pretending that bad things are good. And that's really dangerous. That's really dangerous. That's why all the Tibetan lamas, any great lama will say, it has to be practical. If it's not practical, it doesn't make sense. You know, there's, okay? So first you have to recognize what it is. Who said the flower, right? There's a flower. It has a stem and it has a, it has um, petals and it has a smell and it has a color, right? These are characteristics of the flower, right? So the smell of the flower depends on the assembled basis of the parts of the flower. Another one of the characteristics of the flower is the emptiness of the flower. If the flower wasn't there, the emptiness of the flower wouldn't be there. Okay? So if there's someone who's being a jerk, the most magical thing about that is the emptiness of jerkness. You see, the emptiness... In order to transform all jerks in your world, there has to be a jerk to transform. You have to apply the analysis to the jerk. And then you can just find, wow, if I really look at how I'm defining him, he could, he very well could be a high and enlightened being coming to teach me patience. Very well could be, and I'm choosing that viewpoint. And I'm choosing that viewpoint in order to push myself, in order to push myself to my next step in my evolution. And then Nagarjuna would probably say at this point, well, you always define causes by first seeing the results, which means that what you did changed his definition from being a jerk into being an enlightened being. Because enlightened beings, all they do is come and inspire you to get to your next evolution, evolutionary stage. So then he fits the definition of an enlightened being, but only after you did the work. Right? Don't be a pushover. Just be kind, be completely kind, be a bodhisattva with wisdom. Do the perfections with wisdom. It's really not, it's not worth it just to give someone something for the sake of giving. It should be with wisdom, and then it plants a very special kind of cause in your mind. Right? Is this fitting in a little bit? Here's some argument. He wants to argue with me. something in front of me. Here's an object. 
you know. When I look at it, it I I experience it through one of my sense powers. Right? Like I see it, I smell it or something, right? And then I label it, right? Like it's this and I like it or I dislike it. I want to move away from it or I want to go towards it or whatever. Right? So then some analysis, right? It's a cause thing, all these different emptiness, right? Emptiness proofs, right? So then here's the object. I experience it. But it's not appearing how it truly is, right? It's appearing different than how it really is. Because it seems like it's coming from its own direction, but really it's not. You know? So they say different emptiness analysis. Oh, it comes from causes. It comes from cause, so it has no inherent qualities of its own, you know? Which means that the thing I think I'm seeing, I'm not seeing, because what I'm really seeing is a picture, a picture in my mind, you know? I'm seeing something due to my own karma because of how I've treated others in the past. So that part, no missing steps so far? No. The missing step is after? Okay, so let's go forward, right? I'm seeing something. I thought I was seeing it, but really it's just a picture in my mind. And it's being for that what the picture is depends on how I've treated others in the past. But it but it's not because it deserves the picture on its own, because other people have a different picture for it. This person I think he's a total jerk. But his mom loves him and his best friend thinks he's cool. And he's yelling at me right now, I think it's horrible, but the other person who wants my job thinks it's the best thing ever. You know? So it's so the way, so the way I'm thinking of him isn't coming from him. You know? So that's one way of thinking of him as a jerk. But then if I really look at it and I say, I can use this as an opportunity. He could be teaching me the highest lesson ever right now, depending on what I do with it. So I'm going to be a little more patient. I'm going to be a little more patient. Okay, so now I have two choices. Now he's either a jerk, which he's a jerk, or he's an enlightened being, which he's an enlightened being. Does he deserve any of those labels from his own side? No. Does the thought in your mind deserve the label and each of those labels either? No. Totally equal. The two choices are 100% equal, equivalent. They're to both completely empty. They're both mental images. You choose one mental image, and it's an excuse to have mental afflictions. You choose the other mental image, and it's an excuse to do virtuous things. Mental afflictions lead to suffering. Virtuous things lead to happiness. So I'm going to choose the one that's going to lead to happiness. But why, why would I just choose happiness if I'm the only one that's going to benefit? Ah, but I'm not the only one that's going to benefit because when I have less mental afflictions, I have a greater capacity to help others. When I have a higher degree of inner fulfillment and happiness, I have a greater capacity to share love with others. Still missing step? No. Okay. <laughs> sure? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's kind of like you're making a choice whether to relate to things based on how they're appearing or to relate to them with wisdom. And it's a very clear choice. You know, how it's appearing is ugly. How it really is, is not ugly. How it really is, is beautiful, because it's the potential for, for bliss. It's the potential for ultimate happiness. What's more beautiful than that? You know, it's like when people see babies and they're like, wow, they're so pure. You know how they say that? Like, they're so pure, like everything is possible for them. You know, like they're so un dirty or something, unstained. And that's a characteristic of the thing you're looking at. You see? So it's like the flower. 
like the the ugly person who's like has a who's mean or whatever. One of his characteristics is the emptiness of ugly people. And that is an incredible, beautiful, unstained characteristic of him. And depending on how you act towards it, then you can change that into an object. Even a table. That table, all it's doing is holding up the computer, but it could be giving you infinite amounts of bliss. You know, it's just that it's our mental image. We don't have a mental image for that. Thing. We have a mental image for a table that's going, going, gone. You know, it's going to be turned into garbage. You know, like that. Mm. So you can make this choice where you see that it couldn't possibly exist the way you're seeing it. Period. And then you just make a new choice. Right? And always remember the step one of Mahamudra, it's changing instant to instant, right? The definition of a functioning thing. Imagine what that means. Imagine what a change is in a split second. That means by the time the photons went through your thing, Nancy described it perfectly, I don't know any medical stuff, but it goes into your eyeball <laughs> somehow. And then your brain reads it, and then it gets this label, and then it's defined. By the time it's defined in your mind, the thing has changed infinite amount of times already. It's already changing. The jerk could have been gone already anyway. You know, so there's so many proofs when it comes to lack of self-nature, lack of inherent existence, where we find that the way it's looking is not the way it really is. The way it's looking is not the way it really is. You know, it's an illusion, and because it's an illusion, it exists. And because it exists, it's there in front of us for us to analyze, to find that it's empty, so we can transform it into something that exists as paradise, right? If you think of how, to have the opportunity to look at something and say that I won't react to it, I won't act towards it based on how it's appearing, to have that kind of opportunity to see something and make that choice is so special. And that takes a lot of amazing good karma. That kind of a choice is so rare. And if you think about how many people in this world can look at what they're looking at and choose not to relate to it based on how it's appearing. Then we talked about the difference between a mental image that's real of an object and a mental image of an imagined thing. Do you remember that from last class? And one of those two things has no qualities of its own. Automatically, right? When we think, I'm sitting here and I think, my body is made of light, you know, and it's filled with empty blue sky, you know? And it's this imagined thing. It's this kind of mental image where it's this total imagined thing. See, an imagined thing, we already are thinking of as a projection, right? We're already thinking of an imagined thing as something that has no qualities, that doesn't truly exist. So in many ways, the imagined thing is closer to the truth than the object that we see, which we do think has qualities of its own, which we do think truly exists, right? So if you look at a table and you close your eyes and think of that table, you're thinking the mental image is of an object which we are saying it truly exists. Then you're going to say, I'm not saying it truly exists, but then you check. Now think of your body filled with light. 
Are you thinking of it in the same way as the table? No. You're closer to the truth when you have the mental image of an imagined idea, which is kind of this interesting thing. It gives this clue. We can use, with wisdom, we can use these imagined ideas to get beautiful, beautiful results. To get beautiful, beautiful results. And when we start to relate to objects as if, and people and places and experiences like they don't have qualities of their own, then those are going to be, you know, doorways into our future in life. what we're doing. We're sitting down and we're saying there's two kinds of mental images. One is of things that exist and one are things that are imagined. But they're totally equal. They're totally empty. So now I'm going to choose the mental images that I want. You know, normally we're just being invaded by all our sense perceptions and we're being ruled by our sense powers. That's why they're like try to limit what you're getting, all the sense, you know, overdrive that you're getting, because then you start to, you know, you, there starts to be less of that overbearing, you know, continuation of our habitual way of just following what attracts us and what, you know, and running away from what we don't like. And then we can apply it to normal things. So it's like it's like this. It's like a blueberry. So we're like, this is a blueberry. But I never saw a blueberry. It's a picture in my mind. So that I make a choice. When I give this away, I'm not gonna say it's a blueberry. I'm gonna imagine that this is going to cause enlightenment. This is bliss and emptiness, you know, in the form of a blueberry. And I'm giving to somebody else. And in that way, this is how we begin to wield deceptive reality. And the reason why emptiness teachings are high teachings is because you can't go to and say that to anybody. Because it's not just about imagining things. You have to go through the doorway of understanding emptiness, of studying and contemplating and meditating on emptiness with the motivation, with pure motivation, to end suffering for others. And then you can, and then it's your responsibility to say that due to its emptiness, this is empty, John is empty, and the action of giving it is empty. And therefore, I say it's the cause to enlighten. Right. And then that, that is an imprint in your mind, and he just ate it. You ate the cause of enlightenment. Right. You know? And that that sticks. When it's done with wisdom, that sticks. You know. So <laughs> it is our huge responsibility to study, meditate, and contemplate. Right? It's we have to do this. We have to learn about emptiness. You know, to a high, high, high level. High level, you know, and just all oh, I really feel like everyone's an angel. It's not enough. Because once one of those angels does something bad to you, it's not easy. You know, you really need to have your achievements in meditation. You know, your inside, remember the inner solitude, right? That special place you're taking around with you, that place where you sit with your llama, inside, that should be like perfect. That you can always, you always know. Then someone can ruin something you just worked on for a hundred hours and just totally ruin it and you're still smiling because you don't want them to get worried or something. You know? That would be great. So then, if, if we were to ask, how do we make uh, how 
how do we make these meditative states of a yogi completely pure? As it was stated, they are purified by means of prayer. Because of their great compassion, bodhisattvas make a prayer to look after the needs of every living creature. Because of the power of this prayer, yogis subsequently become practiced in the arts of giving and the rest. And this way their meditative states become completely pure. So this is from the reading, right? So in, in this section of the reading, Master Kamala Shila is talking about bodhisattvas who have reached the first bodhisattva level. It's called the first bodhisattva union. It's when you directly perceive emptiness. You know? So they're saying that at this point, the yogi can truly practice the six perfections. Okay? Do you remember from Course 1 that you can't call a perfection a perfection unless it's imbued with wisdom? Do you remember this? And it's exactly what we're talking about here. Just giving something without wisdom is just another kind of suffering. Because deep down, on, on the bottom level, there's this looking to the next moment to be happy. There's this fundamental ignorance which is there. It's totally infected. So with the six perfection, we see that all beings are completely empty of having any characteristics of their own. And then with that wisdom, we can we act we act out towards those beings to create beautiful results, right? To see real change, you know, to create uh, to unveil their ultimate potential. Do you remember all the way back in Book Chapter 1? And Master Kamala Shila starts off the book and he's like proving why you need to have the union of method and wisdom together. And now in this part of the book, he's doing it again. So he's saying even once a bodhisattva has directly perceived emptiness, then that's when you can truly have the union of method and wisdom. You see, because then every single one of the actions that you're undertaking are imbued with your perfect understanding of emptiness. You see that? So here's another quote. Take someone whose mind is not at all directed towards working for the sake of living beings. Someone who is not focused at all on making every effort for them that this person could achieve unsurpassed, totally perfect enlightenment is something I have never taught. And that's from the Sutra of my true intent. Take someone whose mind is not at all directed towards working for the sake of living beings, someone who is not focused at all on making every effort for them, that this person could achieve unsurpassed, totally perfect enlightenment is something I have never taught. You have this like undying love for other beings that you've developed, you've developed your compassion to a very high level. And you see that they're all in appearance. So you take 100% responsibility to help every single one. So the beginning of Bhava Nakrama was about why, why would you even want the goal? And then this section of the book is really about how, how do you achieve the goal? You know, what, and then we go into Bhava before, which is what are the realizations you're having on each level all the way up until the group, until the level for the benefit of all the And we're gonna do it, we're gonna go through all of these steps by seeing how our perceptions are valid, how they are incorrect, and then how we can wield deceptive reality in order to transform it in 
into ultimate enlightenment. And the one reason is from the very beginning, because we do not want to see other people suffer. And we do not want them to, to continue suffering ourselves. But even worse than suffering is acting out, not knowing whether what you're doing is going to help or it's just going to cause more pain, right? Um, sometimes I, I get a little overwhelmed thinking when I'm acting and I, I want to harvest the, the moment and to see the emptiness in the action or the thought, whatever is hitting me. But then, like, so after I've, you know, taken a moment to, to really see the emptiness in it, then dedicate it. Like there, I just feel like there's there's so many opportunities in every moment that we're having to to like harness the you know the virtue and the wisdom in it. And I I get a little overwhelmed like in doing everything that I can to you know too many or so I don't I like you know like which one should should I be doing at all? I mean should I be yeah. like focusing on emptiness or should I be focusing on like you know. Like having compassion, yeah, loving compassion, kindness. like right. I mean, dedicating. I think there's as a Buddhist practitioner or whatever, I think then automatically your loving kindness, your general compassion and concern for other people is increasing, and it, and it, it's like a habit. Like you, you start to just give people things first, or notice who's uncomfortable. Right? I'm sure this is all something you're experiencing. You know. Um, and then, then it's, and you, there's many benefits to that. People like you more, you're just generally more happy, you're less prone to be depressed than you used to be, even though still maybe some cases, but it's like less, you know. Um, so then we have to really make more of an effort to really think about the emptiness side of it, you know. And then once you do meditate on it more and more, then it can become more visceral. And then it'd be like, uh, you know, like uh, the thing about the stars. So the, when you look at a star, you're looking at the past. You know, it's 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 a star. It's so far away that the light that's here now left that star millions of years ago. You know, or thousands or billions. Or star is really far. Took so much time to get to you. All the moments in between. Right? It's like infinite. It's infinite time it took to get to. So after meditating on emptiness for a while, then maybe you look across to me and you think that. You think, I'm looking at the past. I'm looking, I'm literally looking at the past. You know, so in one way there's like some disconnect. But it's kind of a good disconnect because then it gives you more room to do something virtuous. Because then you're always looking for the highest thing. N none of the qualities that are showing themselves to you are are anything except for you know like giving you some. Oh, I can do this, or I can do that, or whatever. You know. So any great yogi in in the tradition going all the way back to the Buddha and the Buddhas before him were in the world, and they were just seeing that what they were looking at was karma. What they were looking at was a mental image being forced on them by how they've treated others in the past. So what they're looking at is the past. It literally is the past appearing to you now. And you can't, you can't act towards the past. You can't react towards the past. You can't do anything towards the past. All you can do is create a cause for the future. You know? And then that's kind of like some view to, that's, and the more you meditate on emptiness, the more you get a little more space. And then through that doorway, then you can really develop true compassion. True, real compassion, you know, real, where you, you're seeing that because they have no qualities, that you're the one that can help. You're the only one in the whole world that can and will help. And no matter how much ignorance that they're showing you, 
suffering, no matter how much suffering that they're having, you are taking the responsibility and you are going to remove the food, period. You know? And, so, and the people, we talked about this last class, get stuck. Well, if they're not truly there, then who is there to help? But they're there. They're, they're an illusion, and that's why they can function. They exist, and you can help them. And there's only one way to help them, and it's to become enlightened. There's only one way to become enlightened, and it's to stop believing in functioning things. There's only one way to stop believing in functioning things, to go through the emptiness analysis. There's only one way to do emptiness analysis, and it's to develop great compassion. There's only one way to develop great compassion, is to look at suffering of others, the three kinds of suffering, right? So it's like that, going all the way back. And then it makes perfect sense. Start with compassion, and it ends with compassion. I remember, um, Nancy La asked Lama Maru, I don't understand like the thing about the two mental images. On one hand, I see someone who's suffering, and on another hand, I can see them as an enlightened being. But the, but the one who's suffering, I'm developing compassion. The one who's enlightened, I'm not developing compassion. So isn't there like, isn't the whole point is to get a lot of compassion, you know, and have that be that? And then he said, if you see them as suffering, develop compassion. It's like, and if you see them as enlightened, develop compassion. You know, so, okay. Does that make any sense? <laughs> 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 it's a little more confusing, but it's true. You know, it's true. Because the, it is the thing about it. I guess. Does that kind of mm -hmm. go on the lines of what you think about? I mean, the thing is, and I, I wish there was a way for me to express it. I'm not a very good, some great teacher could probably express it, but there's something about seeing something that's wrong, right? Whether it's someone who's suffering or someone who's being a complete like jerk who is causing their own suffering, causing their suffering, or, or whatever problem. There's something about seeing something wrong that can inspire you to think about emptiness. You know? And I don't, I don't know how to express that, but it's like there's only one way to fix it, and it's to think about emptiness. It's like, and there's, I wish I could really express it, but it's like, and then you open the door into it, because it, it relieves you of a lot of things which like poison our good deeds. Like that so much self-serving BS. Like once you really go through the doorway of thinking about emptiness as the only way of fixing it, then every action you do is literally a cause for transformation, you know? And so transformation, I think, is a crucial word because it means to transform one thing into another thing. If you don't even recognize the first thing, then you can never transform it into the second thing. You see what I mean? If it started out as enlightened, then I guess there's no need to transform it into enlightenment. You see? He said, oh, oh, he's an angel, he's an angel, he's an angel. Okay, well then stop going to Dharma class. So, uh, you know, first recognize, and then with wisdom, then it can really transform. Does that make any sense? Kind of not, right? It's a little confusing. I don't really know how to express it, but it's something like that. I don't see, I, I, I don't, I couldn't, maybe I'll be able to find one day, but some kind of like textual thing. I understand. You? Yes. Yeah. See, I wonder if like that, you know how everything has its own emptiness? They're all equal, but each thing has its own emptiness. And like the emptiness of the thing itself makes it available to be transformed, right? And every emptiness, even though it's equal, it's unique, because every emptiness belongs to the thing it's attached to, like a little label, like in a grocery store, like a little price tag. Every single thing. So wouldn't you think, and this is going out on a limb, so maybe we can all think about it and try to find some textual thing, but that the emptiness of the thing is what's needed in order to transform it, which means that the thing must be there, which means that you must recognize what the thing is in order to recognize what its specific emptiness is, which allows it to be transformed? I don't know, but I think it's possible. 
know, and it definitely gets you away from going to denial about things that are actually going on. You know what I mean? God. Nancy's gonna watch this head in the class here. Oh my god, what have you done? <laughs> <laughs> um So <clears throat> it really is this incredible, fortunate thing that we have a roadmap, like a step-by-step -step explanation of how to meditate and how meditation can lead to enlightenment and what exactly to do at every level, at every step, at every stage, right? All the way up until the Anishinaabe. And what we see is that Lord Buddha is bringing us up through different levels. Like all these different explanations of emptiness. And we always want to go all the way to the highest one, but all of the lower forms of emptiness are so important. You know, and sometimes they, oh, it's totally empty, 100% being forced on me by my karma, and then we still have mental afflictions that would have been addressed by level, Mahamudra level one. So here is a quotation from Lord Buddha from the Exalted Sutra Journey to Lanka. And he says, others have the idea that going beyond grief is the result of seeing that all existing things depend on other things. But because they don't see the lack of self-nature to the things or great intellect, they are not free. So in this, he's saying that the lower schools of emptiness are not able to reach in the bottom. Okay? It's not enough. It's not high enough level of emptiness understanding to reach in the bottom. And then he goes on to say, O oh great intellect, those whose level of realization is that of the listener's way, have the idea that something which cannot lead them out will lead them out. And so great intellect you must make concerted efforts in order to turn yourself from wrong views about this. So does that mean that listeners don't perceive emptiness? What's the exact definition of a listener? It's the hini hinayama, the lower listeners. Yeah. Okay. yeah. What was the question? It, do it doesn't mean that hinayama Buddhists don't see emptiness directly. It's just not their goal, right? Their goal is nirvana. Yeah, but the, well, the Lord Buddha just said that you can't reach nirvana by seeing the Hinayana view of emptiness, right? The listener's view of emptiness. And the, their goal is nirvana, right? <laughs> so do they directly perceive emptiness or not? They do, but not quite. Yeah, that's the perfect. I was gonna, I wanted to do the answer. <laughs> he can give probably a much better explanation than I do. But yeah, that's exactly it. So the so the Hinayana view, they do perceive emptiness, but it's not the personical view of emptiness. So so emptiness just means the absence of something that could have never been there in the first place. So the very lowest school is saying, listen. Things are changing all the time. They're totally impermanent. Things are empty of having a self-nature because they don't have any permanent, unchanging qualities. They don't have any unchanging qualities to them. So they, they are absent of having any unchanging qualities. They call it self-nature. Are, is everyone familiar with the uh, Mahamudra levels? Have you ever heard it? No? Okay, so we'll just quickly go over it. So, the, so let's say we we're applying these in a meditation to a feeling that we have, right? So say, um, or 
you can apply it to feelings, you can apply it to like an object or whatever. You know, and it's kind of how Master Kama Sula started his text. He said, first level Mahamudra, right? What is it? See, that's what's so amazing Master Kama says, what is it? It's a functioning thing. What are the, you know, what are the synonyms for functioning thing? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay, right, cause, a cause thing, a cause, a changing thing, a produced thing, right? So it's both a cause and result, which is changing instant to instant, and it's produced by its own specific cause and conditions, right? So it's changing instant to instant. So first level Mahamudra, it's changing. There's a, there's a kind of, it's impermanent. The way it is now, it's not going to be again. You know, so if it was a feeling that you're looking at, you might ask yourself, do my, like, do my feelings change all the time? Like, do they in fact change like the wind? You know, like, sometimes I'm happy, sometimes I'm frustrated, sometimes I feel okay, sometimes I feel not okay, and they never last forever, they always like go away. So then level two is, it's really the absence of a controller to the heaps of the person, you know? Um, we don't need to go into it too much, but the heaps are uh, body, feeling, discrimination, uh, other factors, which is like everything else, and then awareness. And so level two is saying, you might think that you can control the present moment. You might think that you can control your own body and your mind right now. But if you could, you would never choose to suffer. You would never choose to be unhappy. You would never choose to see things ignorant. Therefore, you have absolutely zero control in the present moment of any of your five years. Then the third level is the emptiness of, uh, how would you say it? Well, it's the fact that, oh, it's the emptiness of outer objects, of course. It's the fact that you and the object you're looking at could not have ever come from separate causal streams. So even though you can't control this present moment, it's not accidental that you're experiencing the present moment what's happening right now. It's not an accident. It's not that two things came across time and space and bumped into each other. Because if that were the case, then a flower could grow out of your head. Right? So you, how you see yourself, the you that you're perceiving, and the object you're perceiving, are both coming up from one seed. And it comes up and splits into you and the thing you're seeing. Because they, they must, by definition, be coming from the same causal stream, period. Okay? Or else anything could happen. Like then there would be no rhyme or reason or sense or anything to anything we perceive whatsoever. Then the fourth Mahamudra level, which is what we discussed last class, where we were saying how, okay, there's there's a kuntal. There's this concept. Do you remember this from last class? Do you remember? The mind only thing that we went over in the end? Well, it's that the things, the mental, the things in your mind don't necessarily deserve the label that they're getting. So like, for example, you might be like, this situation sucks. But then you'd be like, if you look at someone else, and they might really prefer your situation to their own situation. So then for them, it wouldn't suck. It would be amazing. You know, so, and then they take that to the, to even your own mental afflictions. You think that the thought des automatically deserves the label anger, but it doesn't. Okay, so the thoughts themselves are empty. So then, Lord Buddha at this point is bringing us up into the realm of the emptiness of the mind. So saying, look, the object out there, it can't, it can't be coming from a separate causal stream. It's literally made of mind. You're looking at something made of mind. Say, but mind is, has the nature of holding the object. 
So if there's no object to hold, then what is the holder doing? You know, so then automatically the analysis goes to the holder. So what is the mind made up of? It's made up of these different thoughts. It's made up of these different moments. It's made up of these different labels. You know, the thoughts don't necessarily deserve the labels they're getting. By definition, they're not self-existent. That's due to how I've treated others in the past. Then the fifth level is saying, well, then I can choose to look at this situation in a different way. I can say it's an opportunity. I can say, even though it seems like a problem, I can think opportunity. And then if you sit there and you think, opportunity, 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 how much more so does it look like an opportunity? They say, it's a problem, it's a problem, it's a problem, it's a problem. How much more so does it look like a problem? And you say, now is that really the point of Buddhism? To look at shitty stuff and say that it's an opportunity and to say that it's good when it's not? And then level six, which is right, Lord Buddha's grand opus, amazing thing, is saying, that's not the point. Actually, that's 100% totally wrong. Because it does exist as a projection being forced on you by your karma. And that's the middle way. Because it's an illusion, it can function. And there's no contradiction. An illusion exists. It exists as an illusion. It doesn't make it any less real. You just see that it's a projection being forced on you by your karma, you know, like that. So those are like the six levels. And you can go into meditation and go through the first leg. Are my thoughts changing? Well, they're changing like the wind. I guess they really are changing. Maybe they'll feel good, maybe they'll feel bad. But can I control my thoughts in the present moment? Well, no, because I never choose to suffer. So even this moment is totally out of my control. Cool, you know? And you're like, but is it totally accidental? It's like, no, it's not. It's not accidental. How I'm seeing myself and how I'm seeing the thing I'm looking at, obviously there's some relationship, you know? Me and this thing are coming from the same causal stream. It's so obvious. We couldn't have bumped into each other. It's like, but is this, but, oh, would anybody, what, uh, would anyone want to be in my shoes right now? Even though I'm thinking of it as a problem, would somebody rather be here than I? They're like, yeah, I guess someone would. So it's, so it's not just, it's not just due to the situation I'm thinking about it this way. You know, and you say, well, can I look at it as an opportunity? Like, yeah, I can. Can I look at it as a problem? Yeah, I can. Okay, so I'll look at it as an opportunity. And then you really go, wow, it's a projection. It's a projection. It's being forced on me by how I treated others in the past. It exists. And what I do right now is going to determine how it appears to me in the future. You know? Mm. So then we get to a point where everything lacks any inherent qualities. Everything is an illusion, and it's your intention which allows it to function. Okay, it's your intention which allows it to function. That's it. I feel like Paul <laughs> <laughs> Yeah.